Lovely to be with you again for the next hour or so. Um, let me introduce to you our very special guest for today, our guest speaker. And her name is Janet Harvey, as many of you would already know her. And I'm really honored to be partnering with her on today's webinar. I'm more excited because I love a topic, disruption and innovations. Amazing topic, right? Because it's so all around us in the space of innovation and disruption. Janet's, Janet's session is a mixture of skills development, experiential learning, exciting, and you will leave with something more, whether it's a more awareness, insights, new skills, you will definitely leave with something more. <laughs> During the middle of Janet's um, session, she's going to do a bit of coaching and going to request a client. And you can be a client. And how can you do that? Just raise your hand on the chat box or raise your hand and we will know that you want to offer to be Janet's client. Now, I know many of you would love to be a client, but today she can only choose one. Um, so good luck to whoever, whoever is Janet's client and gonna really ex get a good sense of an experiential session. A little bit about Janet, and I'll only say a little bit about her, because you can read all about her on a profile. The thing I want to say is that she is very passionate about leadership development and has over 30 years of experience in that field. And developing a leadership culture seems to be what she's really good at. Ends a topic on, you know, having a sense of what goes on with disruptions, innovations within a, a leadership culture. So without saying anything more, I'm going to hand you over to Janet. Janet, welcome to the session. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cindy, and, and really to the whole team here at Kotaria for what you've sponsored this week. There's nothing more important than when we gather in community and build momentum together. And it's what's responsible for the explosive growth of coaching all over the globe. And I'm thrilled to be here and have an opportunity to contribute and uh, have us do a bit of learning together. This morning for me, <laughs> this evening for you. And uh, so you gave me a tall order there. We're going to do some learning about disruption and innovation. This topic came into being for me because of a conversation with a colleague uh, in Europe who uh, just called me out of the blue and we were, we were chatting a bit about what's happening in organizations with coaching and the fact that we're, we're, in a, we're marking a moment in time when more organizations know what coaching is than those not know what coaching is. Unfortunately, we also are seeing that in what they know, there are some, uh, there's a range of understanding, quite a, a diversity of um, appreciating the impact and influence that coaching can have on organizational life, on a leader's journey of development, and, and ultimately what the responsibilities and boundaries and borders, if you will, even at an ethical level are for a coach. So um, in this conversation, I kept hearing, uh, uh, I, I've used the phrase straight jacket. I kept hearing limitations, boundaries that were um, causing this coach to feel, oh, like they couldn't be all of themselves. Like somehow the uniqueness of who they are and the reason leaders select them to be their coach um, are getting uh, their wings clipped, if you think about it from a bird's point of view, or they were in some way not allowed to fully express themselves in their coaching. And uh, so when we probed this a little bit further, it became very clear that there was a, there was a bias, uh, a perspective about um, what coaching is, how it contributes, 
that was um, the source of the limitation, not so much the organization and the leader. And so I'm, I'm, I started to write down some of the things that have been true for me in my own journey in working with leaders in organizations of all sizes all over the world. And, and the article that I wrote in Choice Magazine in the last issue was the outgrowth of this. So I, I want to start with a couple of definitions first, because innovation is one of those words that everybody loves and uh, thinks they know what it means. And it's often very much confused with continuous improvement and invention. All of them are very important. Invention is originating a new idea, something that doesn't yet exist in the world, and then creating it into some physical form. Super important. Very important, valuable capacities of being generative. Um, highly support it. <clears throat> but it's different from innovation in that the, the Latin root is innovare. Excuse me, I'm going to cough for just one second here. And innovare means to renew. So innovation is about um, who I am today. Put this in the human context. Who I am today and renewing the, the path of choosing. How am I arriving at decisions that alter the experience I have and the experience that I generate with others and therefore the experience that they have? This is what leaders and organizations are looking for when they say they want innovation. And, and it shows up on the top of the list every, uh, for decades now, CEOs will say innovation is somewhere in the top three. And what do most organizations do? Continuous improvement. <laughs> it's fascinating. They're very interested in the incremental change. Now, I think part of that is because incremental change is easier. We can look at a, at a process, we can look at a, um, a, a piece of machinery, a tool, and we can see, oh, if we just change that just a little bit, that will produce a new result. Right on, keep doing it. <laughs> it's a good thing. And unfortunately, not so effective when an organization is seeking to uh, expand or upscale or um, allow for the scope and scale of, the, of, an, of a leader's reach to grow with the organization's growth. That requires innovation, not continuous improvement. And uh, for another time, uh, please go and do a little bit of research for yourself about the difference between horizontal development and vertical development as a leader, because this is at the root of it when we think about human innovation. We've been really, really effective as coaches and as consultants and trainers and mentors in the world at building a, a bigger toolbox for leaders. <clears throat> what we don't focus on enough, in my opinion, and this is my bias, absolutely, I will own it, is that we brought people to a level of expertise in their uh, capacities as leader, but not so much at the next level, which is achiever. And this is the ability to achieve outcomes through others. So when you think about maybe each of you that are working inside of an organization, draw a pie on your piece of paper in this moment and think about a leader that you're working with or a team that you're working with, same thing applies here, and break up that pie to um, the two categories of operational execution and development of people. And put a ratio in there. How much time does the leader that you are working with um, split between operational execution and development of their people? Because truthfully, what an organization requires is that that balance changes as someone reaches into a larger scope and scale of responsibility. And by the time you hit the C-suite, it's 90% development and 10% operational execution. Now, we rarely say this stuff out loud. <laughs> and it's no wonder when somebody is onboarding into the next role in the organization that they struggle. Because the rules have changed. What's expected of them and what defines their success requires that they have a completely different relationship to the very success that got them there. Now, many of you will recognize that as the cliche from Marshall Goldsmith. Um, it's very true. What got you here won't get you where you're going. If your intention is to expand the scope and scale 
of your contribution in a particular system. You need innovation. It is necessary for every person to find a continual well. And so think, think about the concept of an artesian well. There's always enough water for everyone. Well, I believe that's true inside of each of us too. In coaching, we call that the principle of whole, resourceful, capable, and creative. When we accept ourselves as coach, we accept our leader, we accept the process as possessing everything necessary for the outcome we want to be achieved. So what did you hear there? The outcome isn't our focus of attention. That's not where coaching does its innovation. That's the thing that the client owns, that ultimately something happens in that coaching partnership that makes it possible for that leader to go out back into their lives, make different decisions to innovate their relationship to whatever their responsibility is so that new outcomes occur. Outcomes are on the outside. So what's on the inside? <laughs> well, what's on the inside is everything that's messy about being a human being and messy about innovation. Now, I use that word on purpose because, um, you know, in the title of the article, I talk about disruption. And the notion here is that we uh, get very identified and comfortable with the way that we work that feels um, familiar. And um, we know from all of the work of neuroscience applied into coaching why this happens. Um, our brains are great conservationists. Our brains love habits. And it gives us more energy to do something else when we follow habits. It also gives us, um, out of the familiarity, uh, it gives us the chemicals that create positivity and optimism in the brain. <laughs> so therefore, we're setting out fear. Every time we think about doing something new, stretching ourselves into an opportunity that is um, perhaps inspiring, at the same time, it's evoking a sense of, uh-oh, will I be successful? People don't dislike change. People dislike the discomfort that comes with, with wondering, will I be equal or better off on the other side of pursuing this change? And if their belief system is suggesting to themselves that safety and security is a much higher value than the wonder and delight of creativity, we will stay in our status quo. <laughs> that values conflict is not resolvable. And therefore, how, what's a coach to do? Because here we have a new client inside of an organization and this is a, a high potential leader who has been tapped on the shoulder in order to lead a brand new initiative, um, something very important to the growth strategy of the organization. And yet this person is um, very identified with their expertise and their um, recognition by others that they carry a high competence in that area of expertise after all. Isn't that why they were given this new promotion to, to have this new project? However, in order to be successful in that new place, those must soften, not go away. We're not talking about replacing and, and a complete overhaul or transformation. We are talking about that pie. How much is necessary for them to let go of in their operational execution that's led to their perception of competence in favor of a relationship of development to their people, with their people, with the organization, with the vendors, with the community, with the customers. It is a completely different mindset that requires a breaking of the status quo. Now, I've spent all this time giving this context because this is the dilemma that coach was struggling with. The coach thought that the reason they were hired into the organization was because of their expertise. <laughs> they had industry depth. They had past experience as a leader. They understood um, how this particular organizational culture operated. And so all of this content and context knowledge was uh, the reason they were hired. And yet, as a coach, that's not what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you might be caught in this dilemma. <laughs> what is what I know what matters? And the answer is yes and. <laughs> yes, 
compassion, deep compassion, and um, a place of connection, rapport building that comes from having a common context. Very useful, very important. Um, having some confidence, some self-respect uh, around your acumen as a business person, really useful. And although <laughs> I had a practitioner the other day say to me, yeah, I'm working with this new physician leader. And he started talking about all these medical terms. I had no clue what he was talking about. So I just stopped listening to the words and I started paying attention to how his energy would change depending on what he was talking about. And I, and I asked him about it. It, and it was the most empowered breakthrough he'd had in weeks. Um, so even though he was caught up in his content, I wasn't caught up in his content and it really made a big difference. Now, why? Because ultimately innovation is about changing the way we make decisions, which has nothing to do with the content, nothing to do with the context. It has to do with how does the leader perceive and interpret and make meaning and therefore assign priority. And ultimately for all of us, it comes down to what in my gut belly, what in my heart, what in my head, am I assigning the highest value to? Values and principles, our beliefs, are the way in which we all make decisions in the world, consciously or unconsciously. So coaching has this tremendous opportunity to bring awareness to the unconscious values and beliefs that are operating in our decision-making process so that a client can examine them. Now, we might still pursue those very same values and beliefs and that exact same decision, but at least this time we'll do it purposefully. And we'll do it recognizing that it's less about our motive power individually and much more about how we show up, relate, and contribute in any given context or situation. To me, this is that the, at the absolute heart of the reason coaching is so powerful in organizational life. Where else does the conversation happen that a leader can dismantle the way they make decisions and choices to unlearn, to challenge their own status quo, to champion a new idea in the safety of the coaching partnership in advance of socializing that in the organization and engaging others to contribute something new? I don't know of one. <laughs> and as a result, it has an, an obligation on our part as coaches to give a bit more attention to a surfacing what is the source of decision-making, of choice-making by this leader that would open the door for them to be more purposeful in their way of innovating their relationship to their work and then ultimately being able to serve our first client, which is the organization. The leader is our second client. And the third are the people that are served by what this leader contributes. So ripple that out to all the stakeholder groups, from direct reports to peers, to um, project teams, to vendors, to the community that is um, the source of the clients for a particular organization. So that's a big systemic scale that has the benefit of the work that we do. Never underestimate the power of coding, even when you're working one-on-one. -on -one. So I've said enough, Cindy. You wanted to ask me a question or two, and I just, I get pretty excited about this subject. Can you tell? Yeah, but I loved it. I loved listening to so many aspects you were picking up on, horizontal and vertical, um, the aspects of leadership, and then the pie with operational and developmental. And yeah, there's, there's so much. And of course, the coach, and how the coach shows up in the coaching without all this performance anxiety about how well they're going to do, right? Yes, yes. exactly. And then emerges the question, how, exactly how easy is that when you're, doing, when you're going into a company to do leadership coaching? It takes a lot to hold back and say, this is all about the client and believe it, right? So I think that's my question to you. What are your tips for I love coach? that question. Yes, that's perfect. So um, I often talk in, in a sales conversation with an organization about coaching for a leader. I talk about um, sustainability. 
that ultimately my greatest contribution to the organization is that they, they are able to build a capacity that lives on long after I go. So we might say I take a legacy mindset to the work that I'm doing. And um, I, I always go back at three months, six months, and nine months and check in and see how that leader is doing. And I check in with the leader and I check in with who they're working with, whether it's their direct manager or it's a program manager or an HR business partner, it doesn't matter, and say, what's sustaining? How, how have we influenced the climate of the organization by giving this leader a new capacity in the way that they're relating to the work? And that's our value proposition is sustaining excellence. And when I'm focused there, I'm not as tempted to bring expertise, <laughs> to somehow be the source of the content. Because the minute I do that, I'm, I'm taking away from the possibility that this leader will have sustainability in their behavior change and therefore their contribution. So mm. that's my commitment to the organizational client, which is the first client. Then ultimately, my client is the leader inside that organization, building a capacity that's sustainable and aligned to the performance they are wanting to manifest, whatever the strategy is asking for. So yes, I'm using lots of business terms, and it's useful to understand that that's how business operates. But at the end of the day, it's my coaching in relationship with that person that has them make different decisions and innovate the way they lead. When they do that, and it's really in their bones, and they've taken responsibility and ownership for implementing it in the day-to-day, -day, now we've created sustainable excellence. Hmm. Lovely point, um, Janet, because I hear what you're saying. We don't need to go there to create the value. The value is coming out of the conversation, right? Exactly. As said in the coaching conversation, in our core competencies, so when we drop our guard around that, as coaches, we then become more relaxed. And the second point you made is that the performance is not ours. It's to help somebody else to increase, enhance, or whatever it is. Yes, exactly. Mm. There's a question in the chat about speed um, that, I, that I will answer, and then we ought to probably move to doing a, a small demo today. Um, yeah. I think time, okay, personal bias again, according, world according to Janet, I think time is a construct. Uh, obviously, we all know human beings made up the construct of time. Um, unfortunately, it's become our prison, which is really unfortunate. And as a result, we make all kinds of assumptions about um, what has to be urgent versus important. You know, God bless him. Uh, Stephen Covey really helped us learn about prioritization, making the difference between urgent and important. And yet in doing that, we're placing a value judgment on um, what we're giving our attention to. It might help us manage our time. However, we're, we're still being imprisoned to time. So co new coaches will say to me, how could I possibly do all of that all of that being the framework of the core competencies in 30 minutes. That's not possible. I have to have an hour. Really? <laughs> so we teach in five and 10 and 15 minute skill increments. And they're always blown away by how much can be accomplished in 10 minutes. Why? Because we're not working at the informational level. We're learning how to perceive how a client is experiencing their world and the way they make meaning of that world. We can change our mind in an instant. It's the practice that changes the habit that takes time. And why coaching over time provides a client with the opportunity to dismantle and to remantle um, Otto Schammer's work, to let go, to let come. Um, theory you for those that might want to go do a little research on that. The notion of change it can happen in a second, really a split second, and it does in our bodies all the time. So nature is a wonderful teacher for us about that. But ultimately, we, the personality and the ego has all kinds of um, trappings that keep us limited in our thinking about how quickly we can change. And of course, all of our relations do the same thing. <laughs>
<laughs> Try changing your mindset in your family and all of a sudden somebody will say, who stole my dad? Who stole my mom? Where'd you go? <laughs> well, I'm wanting something different in my life. Will you join me? Now that takes courage to have challenged our status quo and shift our relationship. And that's exactly what we're doing as coaches. So it's very easy to get early results. And in fact, um, I'm working with a, a leader now in uh, Saudi Arabia, who I'm, I'm sure the HRBP person thought this was a turnaround effort. And yet this person really simply needed to get past the resentment he was experiencing by not being able to do what he really is gifted at and came to the organization to do, but he'd stopped asking for it. He'd stopped actually saying yes to the things that are his strengths and no to the things that aren't. And he was in, it was in a job that was a mismatch. Once he renegotiated and he's now in a better position, the guy is thriving. It didn't take very long. <laughs> it took paying attention to how is he making his decisions? And how is that in alignment with the essence and core mm. strength of who he is? So be circumspect about your assumptions regarding time and what things take in order to move something forward in a more positive way. So I'm going to a piece of coaching. Thank you, Janet. Yes. Um, yeah. Coaches, the rest of your questions will be answered after the, piece, uh, the coaching. Um, Michael, welcome. I'm, I'm going to go off video so that we just maintain the quality of your coaching with Janet. Um, so I'll stay off and Janet, it's over to you. Thanks so much. Good morning, Janet. Good morning, Michael. How wonderful to see you. Great to see you. I, I see your picture on all the books. It's nice to see you in person. <laughs> <laughs> a, a pleasure, a pleasure. I, uh, I'm delighted to be here and thank you for your courage to raise your hand. It's not easy knowing you have hundreds of people looking at you. <laughs> uh, not a worry. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in a situation now where I just came back, uh, oddly enough, from Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> and uh, being invited to coach there. And I was struck by this notion of them wanting coaching and witnessing a leader who was successfully coached, but was not being promoted within the company because he did precisely um, self-author, if you will, or move to that next level. And man upper management wasn't quite prepared for that. And so he was being denied promotion. That's on one side. I come back to Montreal and a corporation asked me to talk about quick coaching. Is there a model that can just plug and play like an app? <laughs> and, I, and I was like, okay, it, this seems to be the thing, right? The coaching is now all the buzz. You hear about it in Home Depot, et cetera. I mean, it's a misused word. So I guess where I'm at is in terms of getting buy-in and sustainability, of course, is so important. Yes. Um, so the coach's role suddenly becomes not just about the incremental small steps of working one-on-one -on -one with people, but how to scale that up within the organization. How do you get that buy-in from the organization in a way that um, legitimizes my coaching efforts? Because I don't want to be just another person that comes in, plugs and plays, like a trainer comes in and dumps, here's what you got to do, and then leaves. Yeah. Um, so this it's, is where I'm caught in the whole right. coaching process. Right. <laughs> so if we were to examine how you might shift your relationship to those conversations, those value conversations with organizations in our time together here, uh, right. will that contribute for you in a useful way? Oh, absolutely. Way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for purposes of building our connection, I'm, I'm noticing the language that you're using is quite visual. Uh, I'm also aware that you are, um, you're able to move pretty quickly to different contexts. So you seem comfortable with concept. Have I, have I gotten that accurate? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm a PCC coach doing co studying coaching supervision at Oxford Brooks. Oh, fun. Fabulous. And yeah. um, well, this bookmark for a later conversation. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, when you are, when you're in your flow or in a groove, well, what's the way that you recognize that experience interiorly? Wow. Um, that it's exactly that. I, I get a rush of energy. Mm. I, I see potential and I see creativity. I see motivation. I see commitment. Um, and that's when I feel most alive. Okay. Um, and in all of those examples, you are expressing something being reflected back to you. So your, um, your connection to flow is validated exteriorly? Yes, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it has to be that reciprocal, uh, collaborative uh, relationship and partnership, true partnership, as opposed to me doing coaching, it's being a coach. Mm -hmm. well, I, let's keep going for a moment about partnership. Um, what are the characteristics that define effective partnering for you? Um, clear objectives, um, commitment, willingness to learn. So for me, coaching is really about learning for the client and for myself. Um, discovery and exploration of options, opportunities, and resources in service of an action plan in true ICF fashion, if you will. Beautiful description uh, to my ears. And I wonder uh, if you were to apply what you just said to an organizational conversation, an organization mm. that wanted the quick app, what shows up in this instant? Um, that I'm probably coming at it from too cerebral a point of view. Uh, mm. perhaps a little too academic, uh, that I'm talking a language that they're not familiar with. Okay. Um, and how would you find out whether that um, hypothesis is true? Getting, feed, getting feedback from them, really honing in on what their objectives are and what the purpose and uh, what's so meaningful for them about bringing coaching in or establishing a coaching culture. Mm -hmm. And what would that change in the way you're curious with them? Really what's motivating them beyond just having uh, their employees say they want more coaching. So we're going to throw more coaching at them that, mm -hmm. that to get a, get a better appreciation of what coaching is and what it can do. And uh, when I got to that part of the conversation, I could see it sinking in and then the realization, oh, this is much bigger than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how are we going to fold this into an organization in a way that, um, that we can justify it as a line budget item as opposed to a one-time contract. Mm. And so a limiting belief starts to surface, yes? Yeah, and, and, and their, um, the lack of knowledge, I guess, about coaching, what they thought they knew about coaching, and which nobody likes to be pointed out, their uh, lack of competence or knowledge about something. <laughs> exactly. Boy, do we get right there at the heart of disruption. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want right. this thing, but, oh, that means I have to be vulnerable. <laughs> right. Yeah. And nobody, yeah, and they're not prepared to do that unless, of course, they, they're familiar with coaching, which is immediate buy-in. Yes, and so what's possible in that interaction that gives them a taste? Mm. Right, um, a mini coaching session. Uh, that's, that's what I did at a recent conversation. I said, well, let's talk about stress for you and how that's showing up in your life and what what can we do about that? And having that mini conversation and recognizing, oh yeah, I can see how this can work. How do we roll this out systemically? Because we want to apply this. We've got 60,000 employees. So how are we going to roll this out across different countries, et cetera? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> baby steps, maybe do a pilot project, maybe with one person or one department, mm -hmm. get some feedback and, and adjust it accordingly. And figure out what coaching approach we should be taking. Is it developmental? Is it transformative? That sort of thing. What are you aware of as you listen to yourself say this out loud from where we started? 
Yeah. That um, not only do they need clarification, but I need to be clear and concise and make it digestible instead of throwing the whole buffet at them, really making it a, a simple meat and potatoes type approach. <laughs> I'm appreciating <laughs> you have some knowledge of parallel process, right? You're picking up the, the <laughs> parallel stream here. So if you disrupt your own status quo, it, right. it's so hard. We so love what we do as coaches. And we just <laughs> want everybody to know. <laughs> right, right. But they can't, they can't eat out of a fire hose or drink out of a fire hose. Sorry, mixed metaphor. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's remembering that shift in relationship to give them an yeah. experience from That's a they, Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate that perspective. Yeah, it's nice to be not taken out of my world for this few minutes here. And uh, yeah, yes. thank you. Yes. And so given what you've just discovered that in a very short period of time, you let yourself unlearn to relearn. You're mm. not missing anything in your toolkit to have a different relationship to those chemistry conversations and business development conversations. What's something you want to change about your approach that will help you remember this insight? Well, you're right. I am very visual. So I think um, what's coming to mind is some sort of graphic, not necessarily a mind map, but something simple, a simple document that just clearly, concisely lays it out. Because I left them with a 10-page document and their reaction was, oh my God, we don't have time to read this. <laughs> and of course, my reaction was, you don't have time to read a 10 page document, but you're willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to roll out a coach. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, so look at that tension. Look at the tension between those two ideas. Right. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, I got to make it maybe a two page document, <laughs> you know, one page that they can flip over and say, okay, that'll be enough to get the ball rolling. Yeah. So what's the purpose? Of the two-page document that's meat and potatoes, simple. Right. What's yeah. really the purpose of that in the, in the overall relationship that you're building? Uh, clarity, um, understanding mm -hmm. in a way that uh, doesn't challenge their quote-unquote incompetency in this topic, but in a way that gets them more curious Mm -hmm. and um, engaged. Clarity, it understanding, puts, curiosity, and engagement. Yeah, and it puts, shifts the power back into them, to them as opposed to relying specifically on me in a way that we can start now to have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what ensures that it's a reciprocal one? Definitely agreeing to a follow-up time and date, which I did not do after this meeting. And, um, but yeah, having a, a strategy and, um, not just a strategy now that I think about it, but the logistics, because we're mm -hmm. talking about logistics there of the actual document and the follow-up. So it's one thing to come in with this idea of this grandiose strategy. It's another thing to look at logistics. And if you throw logistics too fast into the mix, when the strategy isn't fully understood, then mm -hmm. you get a bit of chaos, which is what I'm thinking now. Yeah. And so how will you manage chaos for yourself as you move this insight forward into some simple, clear, understandable? Yeah. yeah. And that's what's coming into mind now, of course, is the Canafin model of complexity, uh, mm -hmm. complicated, uh, chaotic, and simple. So how do I move the complex of not knowing what the cause of the effect is into a cause and effect simple approach. Yeah. That's a pretty darn good inquiry question to sit with. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. well, well, we add it for now. Yeah. And I'd love to, <laughs> I'm looking forward to your feedback on this. <laughs> you can Thanks. talk about me in the third person. I won't take it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank your you, time. Janet. All you right. bet. All right, Cindy, I think we're ready to come back to the group. And um, please, folks, uh, comments, questions, and chat as you wish.
Um, hmm. And and actually, Michael, if you wouldn't mind as client, why don't you go ahead and um, express your experience of that and whatever's popping to mind for you that you want to comment about? Um, I really like the uh, the directness of and the clarity of the words that you used. You didn't complicate it. Uh, you made me. You, you held me to keeping my expression simple and understandable. Uh, great use of humor. I mean, the fact that you were laughing throughout showed a nice lightness. Um, and giving me room to think and quickly sizing up that uh, I had a, vi I don't know how you quite got that, that I had a, that I was strongly visual. Um, and not going too deep. You know, keeping it in a way that we could look at it from like a 360. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like probing deeper, deeper, deeper. It was more like, okay, let's go here, let's go here, let's go here, let's go here, let's go here. Now that we've gone the circumference, how can we go to the top of the circle and look down at it and what's coming up from you there? So I, I felt in safe hands. I felt um, it was, I didn't feel directed. I didn't know where we were going, quite frankly, um, <laughs> but I but I felt it was incredibly beneficial. Okay, uh, Cindy, anything you want to say? I'm not seeing anything on the on the chat, so other than wow, twelve. Yeah. <laughs> it is right to questions there, and I, there's one on the Q and A part. Um, the, I'll read it to you. Can you see it, uh, Janet? Uh, that didn't seem like that was a about. Um, oh my! No? Those are those aren't questions about the coaching. So I just wanted to see if okay. there were any coaching. About the okay. Coaching. Coaches, if you have coaching questions, we've got. Um, we did have a coach join us and disappear. Do you have any coaching or questions on the piece of coaching you just experienced? Do you have any questions on that? I mean, I'll, I'll, let, them, I'll let them do that. I, and I want to address a couple of things that Michael said. So we set a coaching agreement at the very beginning. And you, you were quite clear about the dilemma that you're facing in having these types of business. I, I named them business development conversations. And that seemed to land when you heard me use that language. So I, I'm repeating it. Um, and, and that there was a desire for there to be reciprocity and that you would recognize being in a state of ease and flow by what gets reflected back to you. And uh, so those become the compass. I don't need to know where the coaching is going because you've declared what it is you want. Our responsibility now in our partnership is to explore that, help you start to surface more awareness of what is driving the way in which you are experiencing a given situation. All coaching is about understanding what's going on, what's operating, what's happening here, what is happening, not what I want to happen, not my fantasy, not my assumption, not my um, uh, wringing my hands, I wish it would be. <laughs> what is happening? How am I part cause or agent of it? Where is it out of my hands altogether? Where do I have influence, All right? When we can start to understand what really is the um, engagement that's available to me interiorly and exteriorly, now I have choice. Now I have choice. And ultimately, to one of the questions that was there uh, about, um, I don't understand disruption in an organizational context, what we're mm -hmm. talking about is disrupting the thinking pattern. What is the habit? that a leader has? What is a habit that an organization has? So Michael's describing an organization that has a habit of doing things fast and cookie cutter. And because that's how they cope with the chaos of 60,000 people. And they began to realize that all the cookie cutter options they've tried didn't work. Why would one more cookie cutter work? <laughs> so, you know, for, for us to shape shift what we're doing to match their status quo is lunacy because they're actually talking to you because what they've been doing in their status quo isn't working. 
That's kind of the cosmic joke. They're looking for the very thing that they're comfortable with and it's not actually the solution that will get them what they want. So we have to hold that tension of presence <laughs> between status quo and innovation in all kinds of ways. Uh, we've been, in my earlier remarks, I was talking specifically about the thinking patterns of an individual. But it certainly applies in the case of an organization and a system. What are, the what are the thinking patterns that are their status quo that have them held there? Because there is nothing possible in transformation or change, whatever word you want to use, until people can loosen their grip on what's comfortable and familiar. And we loosen their grip by tapping into their inspiration. So you watched Michael get animated. <laughs> All of a sudden, he was pulling up models and ideas, and I could do this, and I could do a drawing. And like the minute that animation started to show up, I'm like, he's done. <laughs> Enough for now. <laughs> now, mind you, I didn't let yeah. you off the hook without getting to a commitment to yourself, right? Coaching is both deep in learning and forward the action. So it's not enough to get a breakthrough in the thinking. Just as you said for yourself with this client, you didn't get a follow-up meeting date. You got their minds opened up, right? They were leaning into the conversation with you. And the next step of good quality partnering is sustaining, sustaining that, right? So there's something in your own rhythm to be looking at. It's like, huh, how, how is it that I only could do half the job? How do I do the whole job? How do I remember to do the whole job? Right? And, and so coaching is about bringing to the surface uh, with that particularity, what is the thinking process from beginning to end? And where do I take myself out as a leader of, the, of finishing the job? In, in this case, right? I'm just using your session as an example. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah. Um, so two things come out for me. It, it was very, the experience was, it really was an experience as opposed to I tend to think a lot. <laughs> and I think that's reflected also in what you're saying of my inability, let's say to close out. And it happens in the workshops that I give too, that I find I leave, I get them in a contemplative state. And then the idea of just having them sink back into their world. Mm. And I don't, you know, and if I burst their bubble of contemplation, state of contemplation I feel that I'm disrupting them and they're going to just go back to their default not in a pejorative term but and and how how to bridge that gap between contemplation and and uh, rescinding to a place of uh, familiarity right uh, so yeah, what, that's what's that's, one that's, thing you're, you're you're holding on to from our session that will do that for you having a clear sense of, I have to grow my ability and my capacity and competency of finishing that last, that last part. And, that, and I think that, 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 that's a real new learning for me. Um, and it's something that I've, I guess I, I've been neglecting at, to my peril. So uh, yeah, that's a really good, important learning for me. Yeah. And so you have the insight of being a disruptor. Right. Now it's about experiencing disruption over time as a pathway of transformation to all of you in the thread that are talking about how is this any different from? It isn't. It isn't different from. All of our work is about transformational, transformative, trans, transpersonal. I don't care what word you use. <laughs> we are fundamentally all of us in the business of giving someone the opportunity to consider a new way of being in the world. <laughs> I don't care if it's the CEO of an organization or Susie next door that's getting married to her high school sweetheart and is scared about what it will mean to be married. In both Ooh. situations, people are choosing to disrupt their lives. Yeah. They're asking for something to be different, even if they can't quite yet articulate it, and even if they're scared down to their bones at the whether or not they're going to be okay on the other side. That is normal human behavior. We have the great privilege to give them a thinking space, a critical thinking space that helps them to connect, reconnect to their strengths and to their core uh, capacities as a human being, 
what's unique for them, help them to begin to look at the relationship they do have with their life, professionally and professionally, and ask the question, how is it serving? And where it's not serving, what am I choosing? How do I choose that? And that's why coaching of over time, it is so important because we are going to do unlayering. We didn't in 12 minutes with you. <laughs> mm. You very beautifully described. We got the territory and you got some perspective and you got a breakthrough in one piece of this that says, mm, my finishing might be a place for me to do some deepening work. You might go away and do half a dozen mm. sessions finishing. <laughs> it's going to have you know, lots of ripples for you. Well, the same would be true for a leader. We might get the, the spark of, oh my gosh, this is what's in my way. Well, you've got two or three or four decades of habit and strength-based development of doing a certain way. And you now know what you want to change in that relationship. You don't know the how yet. And that mm. will take time, right? That's going to unfold as we stay curious with ourselves. And frankly, in a lot of ways, help people come current. So many people have developed capacity that they don't use. <laughs> They're so focused on the operational execution, they've forgotten about their brilliance with humor. How many coaches do I know that get so dead serious? Like, seriously. <laughs> uh, it, co humor is the way all human beings navigate the stress muscle. Ooh. When we take ourselves a little more lightly, we loosen the grip. We're not so attached. And when we can loosen the grip for even just 30 seconds, creativity fills the space. Now we have resource, something we can consider, even if we don't, uh, don't follow it at all. If for 20 minutes with my coach, I can follow a thread and look at all the possibilities of it, I might get to the end of that 20 minutes and say, not the right thread. But I found two tributaries <laughs> that are worthy of some investigation. Right on. I've broken my status quo. I'm in creative flow again. Yeah, that's our contribution. <laughs> All right, let me see. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to just take a quick look here and see if there's <clears throat> something I can address. And while, you, while you're looking, Janet, can I invite Ram to ask any questions he may have? or something or a discussion point you want to raise, Ram? Uh, and, and no questions, really. It was an excellent session. The, the only point that I want to reaffirm what Janet said is all coaching is about disruption, really. Uh, it's about reframing. That's a fundamental. People have limiting beliefs, and those li limiting beliefs have to be explored, investigated, and inquired into and changed. And one of them came up pretty strongly or actually two of them, one in terms of the organization that Michael is working in and Michael's own uh, limiting beliefs about certain things. And, and that, that's really, many people are asking about how can disruption be done on scale and all that is. But ultimately, when you're working with an organization, that's what happens. It happens at various levels and then it spreads across the organization. It becomes a culture. Um, yeah, that, that's the only observation that I want to make. And Janet, you might like Yeah, to I'd love to pick up that thread, Ram. Um, it is about climate, <clears throat> how a leader behaves. Time is the only commodity a leader has. The way that they behave, what they give attention to, is what sets the tone for everyone else. That's what everybody else follows. So leadership coaching is the way to scale in an organization. And that starts from the very first business conversation, as Michael and I were exploring, that the, whoever the sponsor is for coaching, whoever the HR business partners are, helping to open their minds about what really causes an organizational climate to shift its mood. Fernando Flores used to say, we're ambassadors of hope and orchestrators of mood. This is true. We give people a place, a moment in time, a place in a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, a place in a conversation with a team. When I'm working with a senior team, we are absolutely exploring how they're seeing the organization. What are they paying attention to? What meaning are they making of it? What other possibilities are there? Nine times out of 10, they hear each other and go, really, I had no idea you thought that. <laughs> and the minute they can get to some unity and retrain how they're perceiving, they're going to go out in their organizations and cascade that down. That's how you scale it. 
It is about changing the conversation to pay attention to the experience rather than just the doing. So some of you have used the word, the who of the coaching. That's exactly right. That, and to me, that's what we're talking about when we say experience, that it's the, the character that's being demonstrated, the beliefs that are being followed or dismantled and remantled, the assumptions that underpin an operating model that actually have nothing to do with the way people are behaving in the organization. And seeing that incongruence is the first step. Uh, then saying, how do we get to congruence? And when leaders can get that clarity, and then they start to behave differently in the organization, you've scaled disruption and innovation. And we're at the top of the hour, darn it. That hour goes really fast. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Janet, that was a beautiful session. We take away insights on so many aspects that you raised. And also from a lovely piece of coaching you did. And Michael, we really take a lot of insights from your sharing on what you experienced. And coaches, as you walk away, think about or pay attention to your innovation or your innovation moments in what you feel is disrupting you. Thank you, Ram, Magda. It was lovely being in session with you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Janet, for an amazing session. Um, to all our attendees, thank you as well. Um, we will take a break now before our next uh, webinar, which will start in 15 minutes. Uh, this time, Ram is going to uh, interview Brian Underhill. So uh, if you want to take a break and join us back here, that would be amazing. Um, and if not, hopefully we'll see you on uh, some other sessions that we have for the rest of the week. But for now, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank bye you. Bye, Thanks, Have Janet. Thanks, Cindy, Ram. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, bye, everyone. Michael. Thank you. you.